Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Audrey Jacobs, and I'm a founding partner of our crowd. Who has had this much fun and falafel in the same time? This is amazing, isn't it? The Our Crowd Summit, thank you all for being here. Welcome to Demo Theater. No pitches, just amazing technology. So one of the reasons I have loved being part of Our Crowd for the last five years is I fall in love with almost every one of the uh, CEOs. And most importantly, I am fascinated by the technology they have created to transform our world. And today you're going to see some of that incredible technology demoed right here on stage today. And remember, if for anyone who uses social media, hashtag OC Summit 18. Okay, so first, we're going to start off with a sector of technology that seemingly overnight Israel has dominated in the area of transportation technology, specifically in autonomous driving. Does anyone remember, sadly, two years ago, who Joshua Brown was? Does anyone? Okay, did you hear about how Joshua Brown unfortunately was beheaded while driving his Tesla? really awful. But why did this happen? Because the camera on the Tesla could not distinguish between the white sky and the big white truck driving in front of him. He didn't have his hands on the wheel. He was watching a Harry Potter movie, and unfortunately, he was beheaded. So the solution to that is something called LiDAR technology, which is a method that uses lasers and sensors to actually measure the distance between objects to create a 3D representation of the environment. Now, LiDAR has been very expensive to this date, but there is a company in Israel, Innovies, that our crowd is a proud investor in that is transforming this uh, technology to be affordable and ubiquitous in future autonomous cars. So I'd like to welcome Omer David Kilaf, the CEO and co-founder of Innovies, to demonstrate to us and explain what is LiDAR. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hi. Does this work? Oh, yeah. okay. Hi. So you already know what is the LiDAR. You cut off of my presentation. <laughs> Thank <Sorry>. you. <laughs> Beheading yeah. too? Yeah. No, it's time running. So uh, Innovis is a startup in, in Israel. We started two years ago to solve one of the biggest challenges in autonomous driving, which is a low-cost, high-performance LiDAR that, as you already know, it's actually used to create 3D sensing of the surrounding of the car. This is an explanation about LiDARs, but you already got one. <laughs> so we can step to the next slide. Yeah, so today LiDARs, as you can see, the, the, this sad guy is sitting below a very huge uh, LiDAR, very, very, very big, very expensive, and actually not really providing the right performance that is needed. So when we talk with OEMs, they, they say that they want something very simple. They want something that is just 10 times better, 100 times smaller, and just 1,000 times cheaper. What's the problem about that? And, and I think this is because this is really a technical, very strong technical challenge. There are many, many groups there that are trying to solve this problem, and I think Innovi's uh, team has come really with the right solution, the right fit <laughs> of uh, you know, providing uh, the right performance, the right price, and also, which is, I think is maybe also very important, uh, the right time. Uh, we are ver running very, very fast. We only started two years ago, and we already have two partners in the automotive space. We have already a design win with a leading uh, OEM in Europe, uh, which is going to use our lighters in their cars. And uh, we are very proud uh, in order to today to show you something that is already working well and uh, is going to be used, I hope, soon. So, uh, what you see here, it's me. This is. Uh, this is the three sensing uh, c coming out of the LiDAR. Wow, Thank my you. curves never Thank you, look so good. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, it provides you uh, range measurement. Uh, besides that we measure range like a regular LiDAR, we actually measure also reflectivity. So uh, we can actually measure the, the lines on the road and uh, see objects and classify them in order to provide understanding of the scene. Um, we can go maybe to... Oh, Let's do something fun. So I think this is the first time uh, uh, in the world uh, we're going to do uh, the first LiDAR wave. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Asaf, maybe you can help me. So what we're going to do is we want to do a, a, first, a, a, a very fast wave. I think we need to put sensing. the lights up in the, in the uh, audience. Great. <laughs> no need, no need. The no? LiDAR can work They don't need dark. it? Oh, LiDAR in the dark. <laughs> That's right. Okay, let's make it rain So then. if we have music, so let's, let's do like a, a very fast wave. 
Three, two, one, yay! Wow. <laughs> By the way, okay, so maybe we can uh, go to the to the videos. Uh, so, in a way, as I was saying, uh, we're not only developing the 3D uh, sensing, uh, we also provide some of the application there on top of it, like uh, SLAM, providing high accurate uh, maps. Uh, this, this video, what you see, is, is our LiDAR on top of a car. It's not simulation, this is real measurement data. Uh, by capturing the 3D uh, scene and aggregating the pictures and creating those algorithms that match the frames by frame, we can create high-definition maps, which is uh, required for autonomous driving, uh, for gear fencing driving. Uh, so this is one of the things that we do. Um, maybe we can skip to the, to the next video. Uh, what, we, what we're also doing is actually uh, computer vision. Uh, the program that we've won with the OEM is not only to provide them the LIDAR, we are also uh, providing them the software for uh, understanding the scene. So as you can see, we, we, we classify the objects, if it's a person, if it's a car. Um, we also classify landmarking. And this is part of what we do. We, we, we design the LIDAR, but also uh, m many of the uh, software on top of it. Um, so, yeah, Inovi started as a very, uh, very uh, system company and we were growing very fast and uh, very happy to be here to present it. Um, Thank you. Maybe Thank we you. can go to the... Wait, yeah. So this is the team, I'm very proud to present them here. Uh, very strong team uh, working on this to try to solve one of the biggest challenges in autonomous, autonomous driving. Thank you, Omer, so much for sharing Inovi's. Thank you. No more beheadings. Okay. Now we're going to move to cybersecurity. And many of you know that Israel has continually led the world in innovation in cybersecurity, primarily because the veterans of the Israeli Defense Force commercialize the intelligence operations they do in the military and commercialize it into the business world. So one of the areas that you may not know that you're going to learn about today is biometrics. And our crowd is proud to have invested now in the three times in a company called Biocatch. And today they're going to demonstrate their secret biometric tricks that they've developed to catch, to protect consumers and to catch the bad guys. So I'd like to welcome up to the stage Francis Zelazny and Daniel Shagetti from uh, Biocatch to tell us more about what they do and to demonstrate how it works. Hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited to be here. Biocatch is a cybersecurity company that delivers behavioral biometrics. How many of you have heard of behavioral biometrics? So for those of you who have, and those of you who have not, let's try a little exercise right now. Everybody cross your arms. Now try to do it the other way. Seems simple, right? But not so, because that's who you are, and that's what Biocatch does. Biocatch analyzes the way people interact with online applications and devices to distinguish between you and other people and you and other things. Things like malware, robotic activity, social engineering, and remote access attacks. Things that are eroding the trust that we have in our online interactions today. Since 2013, more than 9 billion records have been stolen, making it difficult to tell the difference between a legitimate person and somebody who's using stolen or synthetic identity. Biocatch looks at the way you type, the way you scroll, the way you toggle between fields. And we were founded more than five years ago, and today we monitor more than five billion transactions per month, generating significant ROI for all of our customers, like banks, insurance companies, credit card companies, and other online enterprises. Let's see how it works under the hood. All right. Well, thank cool. you so much, Francis. All right, Daniel, what are, what are you going to show us? OK, cool. So the, we're going to open up the hood and just show you a little of, uh, of, of the info, the behavioral data that we actually collect during sessions. So you can all see, right, the iPad. So we're using two sensors over here. Um, we're using the accelerometer, and we're using the gyroscope. 
So this is basically showing you the orientation of the device, right? So when I fool around with it That's like this. That's gyroscope. Yep. Okay. And the orientation and the, the gyro and the accelerometer. Can it so, tell that I always hold it too hard? Well, yeah, we're going to show that in a second, right? So everyone holds the device differently, okay? So, for instance, when I watch Game of Thrones on the sofa, then I hold it up like this <laughs> and stuff like that. But I know other people like, you know, hold it this way and so on. So the fluctuations over here, that's data that we're actually collecting, and we use that to profile the user. So another cool thing that we use to profile users and, and user behavior is, is, is swiping, right? So for instance, OK, you see that? We can actually collect the data and the way people actually swipe the device. So let's try something over here. Wow. So this is for companies to be able to determine if people who are using their website or trying to log in are the intended user or a fraudster. Right, right. Okay. So once we actually profile the user, and well, we, we, don't, we need five to ten sessions, right? So once we have five to ten sessions, we have a robust profile, behavioral profile that we can use as it's, it's j almost just like a, uh, a physical biometric, okay? But the only thing is that it's behavioral. We're basing it on behavior. Okay, so, so when my, my identity gets stolen, which it has, unfortunately, like oh how many goodness. people's identity has been stolen? Billions. Millions. Eight, billion. I yeah. think it was nine, eight. Nine billion? How many, Francis? Right, right, no, no. Million? Nine. Yeah. Yeah, nine yep. million. Yeah. So then <clears> when <throat> someone tries to log on as me, you're going to use these tools to catch right. them. Right, exactly. Okay. okay, so let's do a quick uh, demo over here. Uh, all right. So, Audrey. Oh, hold the device. Okay. Okay. So it's a, it's a really simple task. What I, I, I'm going to ask you to do is to drag and drop the ball over again, the, the, the green ball, and drop it on the red one. Okay. Great. Uh, the red ball. Oh, wait. Yeah, uh, no, no, you're right. Oh, come on. You're right, you're right. You're I'm right. no gamer here. <laughs> okay. Am I winning yet? No. No. Hey, where's my points? Ah, oh, look at that. Look okay. At that. So let's see the analysis, huh? Audrey, have you been drinking this morning? Not yet. Well, <laughs> meet me in the shock, midnight. <laughs> okay, so what you see over here, the touch-up, is that's actually when you, uh, you started swiping. That's, so you have a fairly steady hand over here, but when you actually drop the object over here, so we see fluctuations. Wow. So that's one thing that's interesting. So, okay, let's so look at the... So this is my biometric profile. Exactly. This is the data that we collected during this session, okay, and during this, um, this task. So... Take a look at that. That's interesting. L take a look at that hook. And take a look at this one over here. You see that hook at the bottom? Um, and take a look at this hook over here. Do you have any idea why you, you did that? Because I want to make sure I got it in there. OK, that's a, that's a pretty good answer. I'll show you something in a second. But actually, that's something that we call um, invisible challenges, and I'll show you a little about that in a second. So I just wanted to show you another profile, what another profile looks like, right? The, the exactly same um, uh, demonstration or, or task. So I'm going to show you our chief architect's oh, profile. Oh, he was drinking way more yeah, than yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So it's, it's, it's totally different, right? Right? Absolutely. Okay. So. So why was I hooking at the end? Okay. Well, let's show you that. So we have something uh, that I just mentioned. It's called be, uh, uh, invisible challenges. So what we do is we actually introduce in, in certain sessions subtle cognitive challenges, OK? It, you, you didn't feel any str anything strange over here, right? No. Right? It wasn't different. No Jedi mind tricks, nothing like that. OK, cool. So what we actually did is we put a three-degree deviation over here. So when you were actually yeah, dragging the, the green ball, then actually we were pulling it three degrees. And what you so did... So it was is, moving and I it didn't was, know it? You didn't know it. Okay. Wow. Because of hand-eye coordination, so what you did is you tried to compensate at the very end, right? So that's why you had those hooks over there. Mm. So we use things like that, that are subtle, that are cognitive. You don't feel it. They don't cause any disturbance or any, any um, friction during the session, and we see how users respond and, their, and the way they interact with the device, and we use that for the profile itself. So and I understand that Biocache has about 400 different biometrics that you can use to actually 
build a user profile? Well, on, in, in web applications, we have more than 500. Oh, my god! And gosh. when it comes to, dev wow. to mobile devices, we have more than 2,000. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Amazing. So we're not only good at computer science, we're actually good at detecting and understanding human behavior, too. So that's the real trick. And just a final thing I want to show you uh, over here. That was three degrees. That's why you didn't feel anything. Let's say it was 30 degrees. It will look something like this. Oh, wow. Right. You would definitely feel it. But when it's three degrees, it's very subtle. It's a cognitive challenge. That's amazing. So your customers or anyone that needs a username and password for protection to log into a website. But, so any customer that has that could use Biocatch, right? Exactly, exactly. Because we run in the background 100% seamless and frictionless, and the end user doesn't feel anything. But we're, they're acting naturally, and we're actually using that to profile them and to, and to build these really robust profiles. Thank you so Thanks. much, Daniel. Thank you Thank so you. much, Francis. You want to... Thanks so much. <clears throat> All right, so we've gone from transportation technology to cybersecurity, and now we're going to move into another area that Israel continues to excel at, which is the area of digital health, specifically in telehealth. So I'm going to ask you, what is worse? Being woken up in the middle of the night by a screaming siren outside, or being woken up at 3 a.m. by your three-year-old screaming to discover three hours later, after you've gone to the urgent care clinic, they have an ear infection. So anyone who's had children, I think will agree with me, the last one is, is far worse. So we've been waiting for technology to catch up with these types of, of situations and to have telemedicine in our home. And Taito Care is a company that has created a developed a, a mobile diagnostic tool that can diagnose your child's ear infection and many other uh, diagnoses. So I'd like to call up Ofer Zadik, the COO of Taito Care, and Tamar Yaakov to demonstrate the device they've created. And please don't tell me I have an ear infection. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Great nice to meet you. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, Jerusalem. We are honored to present here. Uh, just imagine Monday morning, after you had a, a very good weekend, you have a very important meeting that day, your kid comes to you, wakes up and said, I have an ear, ear uh, ache. What do you do? What you, usually you do? If it was my spouse, she, she tell me exactly the same. Go to the physician with the kid. That's what usually we do. And then you have the driving, you have the parking, you have the uh, take the kid to the physician. You're going to the clinic, many people on the line, germs. You think about it, wow. I came here with the ear ek, and I can go out with many more uh, symptoms. What if we could do it differently? What if we could do it from the comfort of the home? Ronan, please, PC. Let's show Live Telehealth the title provide. We provide a device and a platform to do all the taking the reading and the examination at home, doing it online. What you see, you see a physician with the earphones, you see the patient, Tamar, and the physician control the device remotely. So we are going to check the heart and lung sound, we're going to check the ear, and we are going to check the throat and temperature taking. So now she starts with the heart check, and what you can see now is that the physician online Using the earphones, he can listen in high quality. This is FDA, clear device, class two. So he can listen it like he is in the clinic, and even better because this is a digital stethoscope. Then he guides her to move and do the ear check. We have a very special design for ear check, not the one that used by a physician. And as you can see, you immediately he sees the eardrum. 
This is a small endoscope, one of the smallest endoscopes de designed by Taito to provide any consumer to be able to perform this kind of check. Then he looked at the throat. Everything is done in live. And then they can take the temperature. Uh, we have uh, a non-contact uh, temperature taking. And all this is going on our platform to be used by the physician for second opinion or to see trends if there's something changed in that uh, patient. Then you can write down the notes. Thank you. Thank you so no, much. No, no. Thank, you. Thank you for phase one. Okay. Can, okay. I, can I ask you, uh, this, let's see, your company, Tidocare, is in our digital health fund and the Cure Fund. Yeah. And I was looking at your company. How did you, as an early young Israeli startup, get Walgreens already as an investor and a partner? Um, I think that we, we came with, uh, we are two founders, and my, uh, the other founder is a very creative person. And we are looking always how to change things to make it easier for the people and to the benefits of healthcare and uh, the people. So we were looking how things are being done today and how it's going to be tomorrow. If you ask yourself, and I have three daughters, all of them say, I don't want to leave the house. I can do everything from the internet. <laughs> so why, why can't we do it with healthcare? Right. And this is what we are trying to bring and we are bringing now because currently we have uh, customers in the US working with this such solution and all the health providers are now looking how to provide a better health, a better cost, effect, cost effective. And if you just heard about Amazon and, and uh, Berkshire, they are now trying to see how we can reduce the expenses on healthcare. So if you can save a visit to the ER, you can save up to $2,000 on your expenses. So I, now I go to the second phase. Well, we, we, what we had till now is just live telehealth. What happened if we want to save the time of the physician? So why not taking all the reading previously before you have the visit with the physician, do it by yourself without medical skills and upload it to the cloud for the physician to see? Is that iPad, for nine. Thanks. So, what type of uh, patients are these? What are they? So, so it's part is one of your family member. Okay. You choose whoever you want to check, and this in this case will do the exam and forward, and uh, Tamar will be checking herself. The patient gets uh, a, a short movie, and then algorithm that says, "Look, this is a good throat exam." We incorporated algorithms to make sure that what the physician sees is what he was looking for when he was doing it in the clinic. Now we are doing an uh, ear check. We have a short movie showing what to do. Now she's doing it online. It shows you where to go, and when it recognizes the eardrum, it says V. This is like a missile uh, uh, routing. So what you have here it's is amazing. done online. She's doing it just now. This is, this is being uploaded to Amazon, HIPAA compliant server. And every physician that has ability to connect to our platform can go and see all this reading. PC, Ornan. So, Ofer, this is very important. Has this been approved by Jewish grandmothers? Yeah. Yeah. Because, because they'll say, your, your machine doesn't work, I, I know better. So. First of all, we empower people, because the, now they can see whatever the, the physician sees. And this is very important, because we are looking to be empowered, and with this technology, you can go and see your, the, the, uh, the imaging. You cannot really diagnose uh, heart failure or uh, lung failure, but you still have something that you can play with and, and do it. How and many patents does uh, TitoCare have? How many? Yeah, how many patents? Do you know? How many? I didn't patents. Uh, oh, patents. Patent protection. Oh, of course I know. Yeah. Uh, we already COO, got two granted. Know. Yeah. Okay. Two granted. And we have another eight on the line. I'm running Fantastic. pending. Fantastic. All right. So just to finish that, we are, this is the, what the clinician sees. He can go and see the ear check. 
you can see all the other examination, and I can tell you, we are doing it from coast to coast, from here to China, the technology works, and we showed it uh, to many uh, health providers, and currently we have over 25 health systems in the U.S. working with Taito Solution. Amazing, Ofer. Anyone who wants to bring Taito Care to their community, I encourage you to speak with Ofer and learn how we can transform the future of healthcare together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back to cybersecurity, but moving away from online into video. So it was, it was five years ago that there was the Boston Marathon bombing. And what was incredible was in just a couple of days, they were able to identify who were the bombers. And this was using the technology of a young Israeli startup that through their video synopsis and their deep learning technology, they were able to identify who was the bomber, because they could take video footage, raw video footage from any camera, and they can pinpoint and identify precise images and patterns. This small startup now is operating in 40 countries around the world. And I am very excited today, BriefCam is the company, to invite up Tomer Sar to come do a demonstration about how BriefCam works. Thank you, Audrey. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Tomer. I'm with BriefCam, and I'm here to show you. Not, that's not it. Oh, you closed my browser. <laughs> okay. Are we going to be looking at live footage from the summit? Uh, no, we're not. Okay. Because I was hoping we could look at the crowd and help me find my next ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> So, um, okay, so we work with uh, law enforcement agencies, with police departments, and with enterprises, and we make video surveillance searchable, quantifiable, and actionable. And I will show you how it works. So, uh, imagine I'm a, an investigator, and, and I'm trying to investigate a hit-and-run uh, uh, incident. And what's happened is that uh, People told me a description of a vehicle. They told me that, uh, that I have a blue car or a blue pickup uh, vehicle that was involved in the accident. What I would normally do is I would collect the video, normally hours of video, and then try to review all of that video and try to understand what happened in the scene. But with BriefCam, investigators can simply load the videos into the system and then choose what they want to see. So, for example, they can choose a certain color, and we will filter out only the objects that matches this, this particular color. And then, once they found, they can even further uh, filter down by all of those classes, but particularly now, I will filter down uh, by a pickup truck, and then I found my pickup truck. And then, when I want to do that, when I see that, I can see the, the actual close-up clip of that pickup truck in my scene or go to the original video and see what happened exactly, what other objects were in the scene, and then pinpoint the exact time in my investigation where the, where the uh, suspect uh, uh, was. Uh, but sometimes I don't know exactly what I am looking for. Sometimes I have a ton of video, um, and I, I, I know something happened there, but I don't know exactly what. What we do is that we extract and separate the different objects from the background and build them in a database together with their classification, and then we can build the video again um, we, while utilizing the space and time more efficiently. So investigators can review hours of video in minutes and sometimes in seconds. Now, those vehicles here, let me stop that just for a second. Those vehicles were not actually near each other in real life. This one was in... Uh, 821, uh, 839, etc. Once I only see, once, once I see a vehicle that's uh, of interest, and it's a coincidence that it's the same vehicle from the other demo, then I can go back and see the original scene as it happened in, in real life. Um, I, can, I can filter more here by choosing to see, for example, just the red vehicles. And the system will filter out of this database only the red vehicles 
will rebuild the video from scratch and show only the red vehicles that I had here on the scene. I can furthermore filter, not by area, by path. And if I only want to see vehicles who drove in this particular lane and direction, I can also narrow down by that and see only, only the, relevant, uh, the relevant vehicles or, and objects that were here. So it, it would appear that a lot of your customers are then in uh, the security space. Is that true? Right. So we work a lot in the security space with uh, investigators, with small cities, with enterprises, security part of the enterprise, and providing operational uh, insights into what's happening in the, in the physical uh, premise. And I know so when you initially started, you had a lot of law enforcement type clients, but you're expanding massively to support business intelligence. Can you tell us how Correct. business customers are looking to use BriefCamp? Yes, exactly that, uh, exactly uh, what I was about to show. Um, so business customers can get quantifiable information from the video. We can, actually, um, we can actually count the number of vehicles that drove in each direction. We can count the number of people that were uh, present in a certain area. Uh, in a store, we can show funnel analysis uh, that shows the, uh, how, mu how much time people dwelled in each time, in each location of the, of the store, and provide also funnel analysis to know when shoppers left out without completing the purchase. Right. My best girlfriend owns a clothing shop. She says she watches hours of footage to see when the, uh, her clerks are stealing money and putting it in their pocket, right? Exactly. So you wouldn't have to look at hours. You could do it, just pinpoint it to whoever is touching the cash register, yeah, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. So, so, so I covered how we search videos. I covered how we, uh, we quantify video. And I will only want to show one more thing, is the ability to make video actionable. So if I set different rules, I can process cameras on the fly and give a, an alert whenever a cyclist uh, uh, cycles in, uh, on, on the sidewalk. So for example, so after I got all of these alerts, I can show a quick close-up close clip of the, of the video uh, or go back to the original video of the actual person um, that, that was on, on the sidewalk. Um, so uh, this is brief cam. I'm almost out of time, uh, over time. I'm, uh, we come see us at our booth. It's near the entrance. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fascinating technology in our crowd is very happy to be an investor. Okay, so now we're moving on to an area that most of you probably did not know Israel has an incredible innovation sector, and that is in space. So most recently, the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence came to Israel. There's a lot of press around it. And besides all the political meetings he had, he had asked to see innovation in Israel. And what did he actually go and see? He saw Israel's space technology. And our crowd is very excited today to introduce you to our first investment in the space sector. And that is a company called NSLcom. So a lot of innovation is not necessarily coming up with something so new, but it's taking an existing technology and making it small, smaller, faster and cheaper. So this is a demonstration of a technology for satellites. So NSLcom, and again, if you want to meet the uh, co-founder who's here with us today, Daniel Rockberger, he's at Daniel at NSLcom with two M's. Wanted to make sure that, because I know they don't have a booth, but this is truly extraordinary. So NSLcom has developed a fabric-like flexible dish antenna that actually expands in space. So it goes very small into space, then it deploys and expands. And when I saw it, you know, you have to relate technology to what you know. So do you know those little things that you get for your car to put on the windshield so it's not so hot when you get back in? It's this big and then you open it up and it's really big, you know, two big round circles. That's kind of what the dish reminded me of. So I am very excited to welcome Daniel Rockberger, co-founder and chief engineer of NSLcom to demonstrate and deploy his breakthrough satellite antenna here with us today. Where, where is Daniel? Ah, good. I am. 
Actually, I think I'll start with what I wanted to finish with, because okay. you, you mentioned the window things. Right. So these are our giveaways, and they are window things. Woo! I didn't even know that. So we're going to Washington wait, next wait, month. Wait, wait, one for me. Oh, you can have one. Oh, so now we're back. Good catch. Great. So, okay, this is a bit too close. So I brought a satellite with me. Um, so no electronics and, and no apps. Um, this is our satellite. Uh, my name is Daniel from NSL.com. Um, and we are a company um, working on a communication system for small satellites. Um, I want to tell you a bit about the satellite and, and what's so unique about it. This, is, by the way, is a full-scale model. One-to-one, um, -one, this is a satellite we're launching at the end of this year. So we're taking our crowd family to space. Um, and this is what we're doing. So one of the obstacles to nanosatellites up to today was the antenna. Um, nanosatellites have been toys. They started with universities and students. And now because of the electronics getting smaller, everything is getting amazing. But the main obstacle for these satellites to become real players in the satellite arena was the communication link and the antenna. So up to today, we had kind of tape measure antennas that we used to use, like this. And they could maybe give you a link of about half a megabit per second. Later on, we had some patches, patch antennas, which raised the link to about 100 megabits per second. And even this was with an enormous antenna on the ground. What we're doing is a one gigabit per second antenna. And this is about 500 times more than any link from any nanosatellite exists today. This is the same kind of links you get from big communication satellites. But we had a challenge. How do you get such a big dish into such a small satellite? And usually, um, the size of the satellite is the size of the dish. That's the big birds. Um, you have a big dish, you need a big, a, a big uh, a satellite like a washing machine. But this is a nanosatellite, there's no room. All the room we had was this little area here. I'll turn it around for you. This is called a one U, a one unit, 10 by 10 centimeters. That's all we had to get this dish into this um, small volume. So that's what we've been working on. I'll just take some tape off. Um, and of course, this antenna had to be with many, many requirements. It has to be flexible. It has to be able to fold. It has to be able to open up uh, to an exact shape in space. So it's got shape memory materials called the shape memory polymer. And also has to be space qualified. It's high temperatures in space, low temperatures, vibration, what have you. So this is what I have, a folded antenna. I'll just move this chair away. It's in the same volume that's going to go in the satellite, and more or less, it's going to expand in space and open up like this. So that's what we're doing. And um, this whole system is going to go to space in November and give us one gigabit per second. So you're going to launch this. The first beta launch is going to be in November. Right. Launching yes. from Israel? Launching from uh, probably India, actually. From India? Yes. Okay. Why India? That's one of the best launchers, an uh, uh, Indian launcher. Wonderful. Great. Well, this is phenomenal technology. We are so excited uh, for our crowd to be investing in NSL.com. And I want to thank Daniel Rockberger for bringing your satellite and sharing it with us today, demonstrating how Israel truly is innovating in the space technology sector. Thank you. Okay, we've got one more to go, and then you can eat. All right? So... Next, there's, an, uh, there's so many areas of technology that Israel excels in, and some of the best engineers in the world in the area of 3D printing and technology innovation has come from Israel. So I don't know if any of you have a 3D printer or have had one the last few years. My son, who's 19 now, when he was 15, he was designing and building his own drones, and we had this massive 3D printer. He was designing and 3D printing the parts, and it would take like almost half a day to a day to print these parts. They were so slow. And we've heard so much about 3D printing, but it's not yet ubiquitous. It's not everywhere. The reason, one of the main reasons why is speed. So this company today, Nexa 3D, has built and deployed globally the world's fastest 3D printer. And today we are very excited to have with us uh, from Nexa 3D, uh, Dr. Izar Madalzi, and he's going to tell us more 
about uh, this incredible printer, and you have this printer with us today, and you're printing something for us, and I don't know what it is, right? No. I don't know what it is. Okay, so what, first of all, I've never seen a 3D printer like this. <laughs> Tell us what is so unique about the Nexus 3D printer. So what you're looking at is the world's fastest 3D printer. Um, it can print up to one centimeter a minute, which is a game changer. Um, it's also scalable without compromising resolution. Usually when you're you know, using traditional techniques, when you're increasing your build platform, your resolution goes down. So we're using LCD technology for our light engine. And as we all know, LCD is year to year, brings more resolution, they're bigger, but also their price goes down. So that works to our advantage because now our cost of material goes down. Okay, so explain for those of us who don't know, how does 3D printing actually work? I mean, you understand that they're actually printing a three-dimensional object. Yes. How, how does this technology work? So um, it's actually a very simple concept. Think about an object like this one. Um, you essentially slice it into slices, um, which each layer can range between 50, 100 microns, 200 microns, depends on the part quality that you would like. After you slice this uh, object, you are essentially projecting a layer by layer image of this, of each slice from beneath. And what you're seeing here, we have a vat that is uh, filled with photocurable resin. This resin will cure in the areas where light is being projected on it. So think about it, we're curing one slice, then we're raising the platform, curing another slice, and in, in this step motion, we can essentially create structures that were previously unattainable. Um, you can hear, you can see here one example, there are many examples out there, uh, you know, using either milling techniques or injected molding techniques. There, today, we have access to objects that were never been achieved before. So, when it cures, when it's done being printed, can you immediately take it out? Is it as solid as it's going to be, or does it need time to sit? It depends on the material, um, and depends on the geometry. Usually, you need some post-processing. You know, it can be uh, between minutes and an hour to post-cure, and it also depends on the end mechanical properties that you would like. So we're printing, you know, stiff materials. We're also uh, printing materials that have rebound properties. You know, you, they can go into your uh, shoes, um, into different um, engineering objects, uh, and that the, the curing process will depend on that. Okay, so like I said, 3D printing's been around a while. Yeah. So the timing now is now, now, finally, 2018, when 3D printing's gonna hit, and is it because of Nexus 3D <laughs> that you guys are gonna transform the world and everybody and every dental office? And tell us again, who and how many people will have 3D printers, what they will be used for, what, why now? Mm -hmm. um, so I hope Nexa will be at every office. Um, the market today is $22 billion. Um, Gartner projects that the growth of the industry uh, will be falling about 66%. Uh, but within this industry, there is one segment that grows actually faster than the industry, which is the high-speed printers, photopolymer printers. And there is a good reason for that. Who doesn't want to go fast, right? We want faster computers, we want faster cars, and having a faster printer just changes your perception. If we're thinking from, let's take just one example of rapid prototyping. When you're developing an, any, you know, machine, you need to prototype some of the parts in the machine. Um, traditionally, you would send it to a machine shop, you would wait, you know, a couple of days, Usually, if they're very fast, you get the part, you see if it fits or not. If it doesn't fit, you need to do another iteration. Conventional uh, printers would take, you know, overnight. Think about it, you know, the potential of having the part in your hand in minutes, seeing how it fits into the big picture, and then doing the iteration. It's a game changer for for this instance, for engineers. So can, can consumers buy this? Can dental offices? How, how would they purchase it? This Nexus machine is a professional machine. It okay. costs just shy of $20,000. $20,000? A little out of my budget. Yes. Uh, for my but kids. 
for what we're seeing here for the complete package, which is high resolution, large build platforms, and very fast speeds, it's the most attractive offering out there. Right. And when it comes to speed, that, like you said, that is very, very important. Exactly. So, so what are we we've, done? What are we we've done printed printing? here for our lovely host is the lattice of a diamond. So you, you oh! have not just one diamond, but three Yay, diamonds. Yay, someone you. gave me a diamond. I'm so happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, beautiful. It's stunning. Thank you so much for sharing us the future of 3D printing. We appreciate it, Izar. So thank you so much for coming to Demo Theater. We have enjoyed having you. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some incredible technology today. All of these companies are part of the R Crowd portfolio. If you want to learn more, come talk to me afterwards. And please enjoy lunch and the rest of the R Crowd Summit.